Um, so last year, I created this presentation for this conference, and I actually did a, <clears throat> excuse me, did the talk about four times, and and actually I got lots of flack, I got lots of love, so I decided to start 2009 off and do it again. And this year I want to do little, things a little bit differently. This year I don't want to talk about testing, I want to teach testing to you guys. So everybody here, who, who works in corporate America? So you guys have meetings, and when you go to your meetings you have an objective. And I'm going to give you an objective here today. And our objective is, if my, can, oh, i got to turn my mouse on. All right, and my objective is, is to, um, to get, um, there we go. I want to teach you guys one new thing, and I don't care what you get out of this, but I promise you by the end of this talk in the next 40 minutes or so that you will learn one new thing out of this. So let's get on to the talk. So today we're going to talk about, no, we're going to listen to this great song first. That's what we're going to do. You guys know what song this is? Years ago, a friend of mine asked me to say some MC rhymes, so I said this rhyme I'm about to say. Nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> now today we're going to talk about the layman's guide to getting it right the first time. And just to let you guys know, it's Taft, like Kraft. The T is silent. Uh, you know, because people have asked me this, and I had to come to the conclusion, and, it's, and it is. It's Taft. So, first of all, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Taft is a phenomenon, not a literal thing. Now, what do I mean by this? People always come to me and say, Brian, are you testing right now? And I'm like, no, I'm talking to you. Um, and they'll come up and they'll say, Brian, are you testing right now? Did you test this code? Someone, I have people who go into my GitHub account, look through all my projects and see if there's enough tests. No, you guys are dumb. Don't do that. It is a literal thing. We're talking about testing when you're supposed to be testing and testing things that are supposed to be tested. Not everything. You know, I'm taking a step over here. I don't need to test that. I'm just going to do it. That's silly. So for all those people, um, I want to send a PSA out. And you guys know what a PSA is, public service announcement. And the first one I want to send out to is, um, hold on. You guys know familiar with this video? I love videos. Have you guys seen this video? Someone asked me not too long ago, they said, hey, Brian, um, has Rails jumped the shark? And I'm like, no, Fonz jumped the shark. <laughs> this is a classic TV show right here. Look at that. <laughs> hey. So, Fonz jumped the shark. So, all the things, I'm going to tell you other things that have jumped the shark this year. And the first thing is um, this thing I like to call C-A-T-F-T. -T. I guess we can call it CAFT. And that's people who complain all the fucking time. You know what? <laughs> Take it that way. I want nothing to do with you guys anymore. And here's another one. And a lot of people in this room might be familiar with this people. And actually, let me say this one really slowly. <laughs> Being an internet loser who hangs out on Ruby on Rails all day just so I can feel some kind of power all the fucking time. Um, you know what? Uh, that's really jumped the shark. And you know something? There's this website out there called Rails WTF. That's jumped the shark. They're, they really do e-stalk me. All my blog posts, all my Twitter posts end up on this site for some reason. These guys really do love me. So to you guys, I'm up here and you guys aren't, so whatever. <laughs> so let's get on to my talk, enough complaining. Let's talk about theory, and that's my littlest one. That's Abigail. She's going to help me do this thing today. And the first thing we're going to talk about is our testing toolbox. Because a lot of people ask, well, how do I test? It's not about how you test all the time. Sometimes you just need, you need some tools. And I'm going to go over seven tools, actually, to help you test. And let's start off. First, you need some magnets and some rubber bands. The rubber bands are because you know they don't fit you. So, um, <laughs> um, no, 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 um, next slide, next slide, next slide, um, first thing you need is something to test with, and this is, and this might sound kind of silly, but to start somewhere, you have to start at the beginning, and first thing you need is something to test with. The second thing you're going to need is something to fake everything else out. Just think about this for a second. You're going to get what I'm talking about. The next thing you're going to need is something to keep metrics. And testing is more about if you can test, but you also need to have some kind of standard to compare your previous tests to. So I like to keep metrics all the time. And I'm not creating an acronym for that. 
And something to keep me grounded with reality. I'll explain this one. And another thing is something to keep me testing. And another thing is also, I am really sad that this is not working, but um, something to create testable data. And Jim Wyrick talked about this yesterday in his, fifth, his fixtures and that long C word, but I can't say, so I'm not going to say it. But, um, and also, something to keep me automated. Um, I'm a huge automation fan. I'm, I really am ex-Unix, ex-security, ex-lazy person. So I'm always looking for ways to automate everything I do. So let's go over these seven items. First, we want to talk about something to talk with. So the first thing I want to do is I want to flash back to 2008 when we were at the Holiday Inn down in Orlando. And what I did is, um, we're flashing back. Um, I put up this slide, and the first thing I said is Brian L. should like RSpec. And you know what? I did like RSpec until I met Shoulda. And I also threw up this slide, and I, I called this my magic testing combo. To tell you the truth, it doesn't look much like this, because I use Shoulda and RSpec. I still use Test Unit, and you know, RSpec Story Runner has been replaced by something else that we'll talk about later. But after using a lot of projects, um, there's a big split. And I realized that, you know what? It doesn't matter which one you're using. They're both robust enough that you can use either one. Just pick this one you like. So they're kind of even. I can't really say one is better than the other because each one has faults that make it, it makes it a moot point. So use what you like. And you know what? I mean, evangelize it. I like to hear the competitions, but use something. And the only losers here are the people who aren't testing, who don't know this one or this one. So let's get into our testing ones, at least the ones I use. I use RSpec. And I like RSpec because RSpec reads in a nice English way. So I could say, if I have an apple, my apple should taste good. And, but should it give us these things called macros? And we would write these a little bit different. And it should have speak, this would be like, apple should taste good. And of course, there's good old test unit, which we all love. Um, hey, Nathaniel. <laughs> um, so we're going to old school assertions, assert, I don't have to read this to you guys, you guys can go. And then there's something new, um, Jeremy McAnally from ENCP down in Huntsville comes up with context with matching and the reason I didn't put a demo slide there because it can look just like RSpec or it can look just like shoulda. It's a good idea, this guy needs to keep on hacking because I think he brings out good ideas from everybody. So look at this um, GitHub slash Jeremy McAnally, he has a couple cool projects there. So the next thing I said we needed we needed is something to fake everything else out. And you guys have any idea what I'm talking about here? Anybody? There you go, Anthony. So yeah. And the first one, and this is the one I use the most. I use, I use Mocha. And the only reason I use Mocha is because it's what I'm used to using. Um, I have no good reason to use it. But you know, it's what I've been using and it's what I make my developers use. So I try to stay consistent. And this is just an example of stubbing and mocking with Mocha. And the next example I'm going to show you is Flexmock. And the cool thing is that the Flexmock author is here. And I hope that my slide is correct, Jim. Because <laughs> um, if, if it's not, just chalk it up as it's awesome enough to put on the board. Well, we'll let you slip by. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, but here's something else I've come up with. And I've heard people talk about this lately, and actually ENCP posted an article yesterday on their blog about RR, which is this, this double thing, which is actually kind of cool. I, I'm going to look at it. And I advise everybody here to take a good look at this. The method there, what they're doing is actually making it a little bit more obvious when you have a stub and when you have a mock. So I could have my stub and just say, return this block. So taste, return whatever's in this block, which is good. Or my color, turn red. I love this. Um, I will be using this in a project very soon, so you'll probably hear about this on my blog. And then we have the good old standby RSpec mocks and stubs. Um, nothing to talk about here. I'm sure everybody has seen this. So the next thing I want to talk about is metrics. And who here keeps metrics of their code? Who's here is really is anal enough besides Yehuda to really look at your code and look at the metrics of your code? Um, the first thing I do is um, Ryan Davis, good old Zenspire, created something called Flog. And flog, basically, you, you know what a flog is. It flogs his code and tries to do pain to his code. And what it does is um, it gives you this number. And I'm actually going to show you a run of it. And on my blog earlier this year, actually last year, I came up with this chart of flog output numbers. So what we have here is 0 to 10. Um, if your method 
ranked zero to 10, you're writing good code. And I don't even write code like this. I'm not really that good of a coder anyways, but I don't write code like this. Nobody on my team writes code like this. If you can do this, this is awesome. Uh, most of us fit right here. We're not bad. We're, we're doing, we're writing okay code. And what this does is it measures, it measures method length, um, branching, conditionals, and assignments. So just make sure that your code is easy to read. It's actually a pretty good indicator of how easy to read your code is. So then we get into where, you know, our little bit naughty developers get. You know, they might write some code, might need some TLC. And then we have this write it over. And then the next, the next one we have is where you should never be. And you'll see this right here. Um, if you're running Flog and you see this in your code, think of me. Say, Brian said, what the fuck are you doing? Don't do that. So I can't go without having a demo. And um, I don't do live demos. So I hired a team of midgets that are behind the board and they're doing it for me. <laughs> and um, notice I'm in Vim, no text mate. And I'm in Vim and I just ran the flog on that code that you saw. And you notice that those are my flog scores, the 21 and the 17. Notice that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too bad, no low numbers there. But if you run this all the time, and actually it's running again, if you run this all the time in your code, what it will force you to do is first write smaller, easy to read methods, not use so many branches, and you know, keep your code in check. Um, and actually, there's a tool that I'll talk about later that, and this is where I got most of the stuff from. There's also Sakuro. Does anybody use this? This is kind of weird. This is kind of out there. And I can't explain to you what cyclomatic complexity is, but um, I know that once I run this on my code, it becomes less cyclomatically complex. Um, <laughs> and all, it's all about metrics. Who cares what your metric is? I'm less than I was before. Go read their site. I can't explain this to you guys. Um, I had to go look up cyclomatic in a dictionary, and I still can't tell you what it means. Um, the next tool is Reek. And that's my daughter helping us explain what Reek is because they didn't have, a good, um, didn't have a good picture on their website. Reek helps you find code smells. And you know, I'm usually good at this at finding this in my code reviews for my developers. I just look at their code and be like, that sucks, do it over. But this is actually something that we can measure. And once again, I have my midgets, and I mean my short people, um, behind the board running my Vims. And what it does, this is kind of cool, it actually runs on your code and it gives you, it gives you pointers of what you can do to fix your code. And you might not do it, or you might do it. Um, I, love, I love things that can tell me how to do my job a little bit better. And you say, well, how does this help you test? What you do is you red, green, refactor. I think as part of your refactor, you should be doing things like this. So if you need some help with that refactor phase, here you go. This will help. So the next tool is good old Um Mauricio, I don't know his last name, Fernandez, eigenclass.com created this tool, Arcov. It's, if you, anybody looked at the code of Arcov and actually tried to figure out how to make it better, it's, the guy is a smart guy, or he's in, or completely insane in one of those, because he has some really hard to read code, or maybe it's just because it's so crazy what it does. But what Arcov does, as we know, is it tells us when we run a test, what code has been run or what has not been run. And it's only using C2 code coverage, so it actually can't look in your, if you have an if, with the with Boolean in it. It can't look at both sides, it only look at one side. It actually only cares about what lines have run. But you should have this. As a matter of fact, every, before you're checking your code, and you should always make sure that, hey, my, um, is my code coverage going up, or is my code coverage going down? Um, anybody, everybody should be running this, right? Right? Wow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know you are, Lark. I'm gonna come back here next year, and I'm gonna ask that question again. That's. Really, at the, at the minimum, this is so easy to run in your code. All you do is type archive with your directory or your, or your file name, and it spits out something close to this. So another tool that I found is called Rudy. And this is an interesting one. Rudy is more about object-oriented design. I guess that's why it's R-O-O-D. I don't know what the I stands for, but, and that's my daughter again. What she's doing, she's peering in my code, looking for the bad stuff. Am I, doing, am I doing good OO? And actually, I have a demo of this, too. So I'm back in my Vim, and my little people, that's what they're really called, little people. Um, and, what, and this actually goes back pretty quickly. And what it does is kind of like Reek. It just tells you things 
but you should be doing it with your code. Like I have cases without else, I have cases without else clauses. Yehuda had that this morning, and I wanted to call him on it. You gotta have an else clause in your case statements. So I, I didn't, I, I didn't know that until I was running this code. So, so. Next thing I want you guys to do, I want to have like a little call and response here. And I'm going to say this, and I want you guys to say it back, because I think this is so important. To measure and analyze my code is to know my code. That was awesome. That, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about right now. So the next, let's move on. So now we're talking about keeping ourselves grounded with reality. Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Any guesses about what I'm going to say right now? Um, all right, I'll give you a little hint. You know, grounded with reality, grounded with business, the people who pay our bills, the acceptance of our code. And in, in the Ruby land, there's only, I guess, really one major player that's actually approachable in our community right now, and it's Cucumber. And what this is, is Aslak Helisoy from the RSpec team put together this great piece of software. I guess it was a clean implementation of the RSpec Story Runner using Treetop as the parser. And we use this, I try to get my guys to use it all the time. Um, this is great. And a lot of projects are actually moving towards this. So what do, what, do we, what do we have here? What Cucumber gives us is plain English high-level acceptance test of our code. Um, everybody in this room, including my wife who's back there, can read this. And they can actually see what this acceptance test does or what it should do. And the cool thing about this is that not only do your developers have insight to your code, your business side or your project owner or whatever methodology you're using to develop, that person has insight to your code. They can actually help you write this kind of stuff. And you're saying, was well, this testing? Yeah, it is testing. It's acceptance level testing. It's actually very important. <laughs> so, to go on again, I gotta show a demo. So, inside of the, inside of, um, I do have a demo here. It's actually taking, it's taking a little while to get on there. So, I have a Rails project called Downloader that we're releasing in about three weeks. And it actually just lets you download files from the internet. It's really simple. But we have um, features for it. And notice that we've, I, I know it went by pretty quickly, but what we have here is, um, oh, that, that was behind the scenes, ignore that guy. Um, what we have here are plain text descriptions of what my code should do. And you say, well, how is this different than my low level test? Acceptance tests describe what the business wants. Your low level, your, your functional, your integrational, no, not your, your functional, maybe some of your integration tests, and your unit tests describe what your code, what you think your code does. And what they should do is they really should meet in the middle. And I tell, and I actually explain it like this to people. So, moving on, we have some, now what we need is something to keep us testing. And who here is using continuous integration all the time? I mean, it's part of your workflow. I know hash rock guys, you guys, it's like your way of life. Um, at first, everybody, and I actually was on this bandwagon for a, a long time, was um, cruisecontrol.rb came from ThoughtWorks, and it's an awesome piece of free code. Only problem with it is that it's hard to use. It, it, it can be configured because it gives you all the source, but it really gives you a lot more than what you really want. So these days, I'm actually telling some people to use um, this next project called Integrity. And the difference between, the difference between cruisecontrol.rb and Integrity is first that Cruise Control is a Rails app, Integrity is a Sinatra app, is that the approach to testing is much simpler. All Integrity wants, and I don't have a screen to show you this, is all Integrity wants is what do you want me to run? And, and it only works with Git, so it makes a lot of assumptions there. And it has all these notifiers that you can use it. We're using with the campfire noti notifier that um, Chris Wanstroff wrote, and I made work a little better. Um, so if you guys are going to try this um, and you want a free option, Integrity is easy to use. Don't use it on like Red Hat Enterprise 5 or CentOS. It won't work out the box. Do it like on Ubuntu. It, work it works very well. And if anybody has any questions about it, Email me, come find me, I'll help you with this. Um, and if you're in the JRuby land, um, I think this is called Celerity. Uh, it's 
a very good tool for testing your JRuby apps. And one thing that the Slurity can do is it can also do, it can do end-to-end -end testing. It can actually test your JavaScript, and which is a big deal because most of our projects in here, we have all these code and we have all Ruby codes tested, but we don't have the actual user clicked here and this part works. If you have a JRuby app, you can actually have Slurity run it and it will do the form testing. But some enterprising individual on GitHub has figured out a way to make this run with your MRI apps, so everybody else's apps. I have not, I have tried to run this. There's some couple of issues. He could use a few patches. It only runs on port 80 right now and some other things. But um, this right here is the future. Uh, this is definitely, I think, if, he, if, huh? if he doesn't make big noise about it, I will be making big noise about this very soon. And that's why I put the link up here. Um, just remember, I guess, the Langlex part. So, Jim talked about this yesterday. Fixtures, fixtures, fixtures. Um, something to create testable data. Um, I guess this pattern is called the object mother pattern. I think some people refer to it as the object mother pattern. Um, I only have one thing to say is um, don't use fixtures. Um, yeah, don't use fixtures. Yeah, th just don't use fixtures. There's, I can find one really acceptable test case for using fixtures and and this is what it is. If you are testing uploads in your application, use a fixture for that. Put it in your fixtures folder in your Rails app. Go test fixtures, files, and then put your up and then put your file in there. But for everything else, um, there's there's other things we can use, and let's talk about those. First one is Factory Girl. Factory Girl is written by Thoughtbot. These guys have pushed out a lot of cool code. Um, Shoulda, um, this. They have something called Clearance. They have a couple other projects that are really interesting and. One thing I like about Factory Girl is that it's really unobtrusive to everything, and I promise I would show some code. And what this does is it doesn't invade your objects. It actually uses the factory pattern to create your code here, or to create your objects. And actually, this is for something I'm writing, so this makes no sense to you guys. I haven't released it yet. I'm not constant releasing. Um, and actually, and there's another project that I was informed of called a machinist. And machinist is something similar, but machinist is really intrusive. It's actually a module that it includes itself into your classes and then generates, and it can, use, it can generate fake data for you using its shams and blah, 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 blah. I like machinist, but I like factory girl. So I'm at a, I have a problem now. So what am I gonna do? So I was, I've actually approached both of these teams and I said, well, why don't you guys merge products? And, and you know what, we can make a Frankenstein product. And I said, you know what, this is how I'm gonna help. I'm gonna help you guys name your new product. So, I've been tossing around some ideas. I have Sheenist, you know, it's both of them, it's the spirit of both of them. And then there's another one, um, my factory girl. I don't know, my factory girl, that rolls off the tongue. Then I was like, you know what, we are, we're in the Y generation, or you know, the speed generation now. We don't use big words. Merle. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Uh, I can do better. And then there's like my factory girlist. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? They're not expecting that from me. I'm just gonna name it this, Cuff. <laughs> so this is where I am right now. Um, maybe there will be a Cuff one of these days. Maybe there won't. But either way, Machinist and Factory Girl um, are very, very good for generating data. And actually, I, I don't have a slide for this because I wanted to keep this quick, but the Radiant Project actually has something else coming out, or I don't know if coming out or if it is out. It's called Data Sets. And this is a very cool idea. I didn't put a slide up for it, but if you go to um, GitHub slash AI Williams slash Data Sets, they have a very good solution for generating a large amount of data, like if you're testing Radiant pages in your CMS. So, um, I actually, probably in the next version of the screen, or this, not the screencast, this is live. Um, the next version of this talk, um, I will have a slide in there for that because they definitely deserve their props. And, you know, there's also um, scenarios, which I do like, but I've moved on to these two. And there's, so there are options, just don't use fixtures. Because fixtures cause problems, and Jim's problem, Jim's talk yesterday explained that in great detail, the, the problems with fixtures. 
So next, we need something to keep us automated. And we always need to remain automated. It's, um, this is very, very important. Um, because if you have to run your tests all the time by yourself, you probably aren't gonna run them as often as you should be. So what do we use? Um, we use AutoTest. And you know, it comes in ZenTest. I kind of wish that, and this is another Ryan Davis tool, I kind of wish he would just pull AutoTest out and use that instead of having to download and install the whole entire other ZenTest. Who else uses any of the other parts of ZenTest? Who else knows what the other parts of ZenTest are? <laughs> Because auto test is like five files, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. You should, yeah, don't look at it. But um, so on. Uh, my friends are back, and they're going to show us about uh, auto test. So to give you a little history here, um, I work for a company called Sourcefire. We have an open source product called Snort, and we have a whole bunch of open source rules that we use for, uh, you know, for bad self detection on the network. So we're basically creating an API so people can query this from the internet, and of course it needs to be tested. So this is how I do it. I actually go in there and I just run all the tests and it runs. So whenever I change my code, whenever I change my code, it always runs my test for me. I don't have to worry about what test I need to run because guess what? It's always running a test. It knows a file I changed and it knows what tests have not passed. So it only runs those. Because look how many tests are in here. This could take it only takes a couple seconds because I believe in fast test, but still. Yeah, ignore those deprecations. That's bad developer, bad developer, bad developer. <laughs> but, um, but notice we do, we, we're very good. We're, we actually try to stay below like, um, I say like 15 seconds from a full run for my quick test set. If anything above that, nobody's gonna run it. And I've been in situations where I actually used to work with a guy in the back row where um, I don't know how long that test suite took to run because I don't think it ever did run while we were there. So we don't want to be in that situation. Once, it's the whole broken windows thing. Keep them quick, keep them fast, keep them green, and you'll always run them. So, moving on. This is what we're here about. And that right there were my seven, my seven tools for allowing you to test all the fucking time. And that is the foundation of of what I think you need to even get started with testing. So now that we have some tools for our toolbox, um, now we need more theory. So now we have, we have little Abigail, and we have our big sister Jayla, and they're gonna help us with this part. Um, so now we need some strategies. And the first strategy I'm gonna talk about is um, spiking and throwing it away. Hey, does anybody here spike and throw it away? Are you guys really a fan of throwing it away? Uh, my developers have a problem with this. And guys who work for me, I'll say, I don't want to solve this problem. Why don't we just sit down and we'll hack out code for half an hour. And when we're done, we'll understand the problem and then we'll throw it away. We'll delete it. And, and they'll say to me, well, it's not a waste. I said, well, no, it's not a waste. What I learned from there is the solution. And now I can go back and write tests for my solution and then implement my solution. I don't want to have that bad code in my system because it hasn't been tested. It's like that spike, all it allowed me to do was get my thought pattern right, and that's all it was doing. So I'm serious. <laughs> Throw your code away. No, seriously. And I know there's a lot of, I, know, I think there's a lot of believers in here, but a lot of people watching this video, where's the camera? Which camera? Is it this camera? These guys? Yeah, that's right. These guys? I'm serious. <laughs> So um, keep it <laughs> keep it keep it short. Thirty minutes. If you're spiking longer than thirty minutes, you're coding. You're in a code session. Kill that. And this is another slide. And I don't have a um, I don't have a slide for this, but I only code in fifty minute sprints. I don't know how people can code all day long. I code fifty minutes. I get up. I go to the bathroom. I get a drink for like ten. So I figure, and I do this all day long. Um, I don't understand how people can sit down for ten hours straight and code. I think you will be so much more productive as, as a coder if you get up once an hour and move around. It's good for all of us. And that's, all right, back to our talk. Um, so now we have this another, this second point, and this is something that somebody called me out on, and I'm going to defend it right here, right now, today. Um, Stop what you're doing, look at your code, and write tests. If you, have it, if you don't have enough tests for what you've written, go back and write them. And then I want you to delete those tests, and I want you to write them again. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you know what? Somebody called me out on this, and they said, you're going to delete your test? You're telling people to delete your test? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you to delete your test. And you know why I'm telling you to delete your test? Do you know why? Because I'll tell you why. Um, people can search for me on GitHub. I can search for a lot of people on GitHub. And what I see in a lot of products or a lot of projects are really bad tests. A lot of assertions of five equals six, or if I, or a lot of things that would happen anyways, and like low-level tests where we're we're testing assertions, we're testing branches, we're testing conditionals. We don't test for that. We never test for that. What we always should be testing for is the behavior of our code. Don't test about what it does. Test about how it should perform, and not perform for performance reasons, but how it should act. So test the behavior. So that's what I was saying there. And you know what? Um, Greg Pollock caught me. And I didn't get to preface it with what I was really saying there, because you know I was right. I was in the moment. I must have had some good tea or something. <laughs> but um, that's what I'm saying now. I want you to go back and look at your test. And if they're bad tests, delete them. You know what? It's only code. Write it again, because I bet when you write them this time, it'll be a lot better than it was last time. And I also like the little Octo Kitty thing. I just want to have a slide of that. Um, GitHub guys have been great for our community. We should give them a round of applause. Yeah. So my answer to that is um, basically we're testing all the time. Sometimes we delete our code. Oh well. So let's talk about this thing, test-driven development. Who here is a heavy TDDer, BDDer? You know. All right. Um, and then of course you're. I want to talk about TDD with auto test, something a little bit different, something that I didn't learn in school, so I want to talk about it right now. Of like, this is a method, and this might not be the best, me best method, but a method for actually TDDing with auto test. It seems like it should be like plainly obvious to most people, but some people still have issues with this, so I want to talk about it. So, what we have with TDD is we have red, green, or factor. Write a test, run your test, it's red. Um, make the test pass, it's green, and then you refactor. And actually for, this, for the green, it's write the least amount of code to make it pass. You know, that's cool. But I want to talk about my next method. Anybody know what song this is? Does anybody know what song? I can be the only hip hop fan here. It's the message. Huh? It's the message. It's Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Come on, you guys saw you guys saw this movie, didn't you? All right, so I'm gonna talk about the message, and I don't have a name for this method, but I'm just gonna call it the message. So let's say we have some code here, and this code right here is we have this. Let's say we want to implement an object called a square, and we want to test for the area should be a length of side squared. So with this, the area, so if you have one that's a square that the side length is four, the area should be 16, am I right? I, didn't, I don't have a degree, so am I right? All right, I think I'm right. So I wrote this test, and of course you have no implementation of this. So when you run your test, it's gonna be like, hey, wrong among the arguments. And I did cheat a little bit, I actually did create the square class, and that's all, it's an empty square class. And what, I'm, what I wanna hear is it's called the message method. And what first thing you need to do is you need to look at your message. And that's the message. And what you need to do is make that message go away. So what is our method for doing this? We either, we either change the message or we make it pass. And that's what I tell people now. Change your message or make it pass. So since you're using auto test, whenever you change your code, it's gonna run anyways. So how will we do this? The first thing we're gonna do is um, we put our initial, oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss a slide? There we go. So we changed, we're changing the message here. And the, what the message was before was we had a wrong number of arguments for initialize. It's because we didn't have an initialize. So now we have an initialize with side length. Notice there's nothing inside of there. It doesn't do anything. But all I was doing was changing the message. And now I get a new message. It says undefined method area for my square instance. So, and you notice, and I'm pointing out the message for the people at home so they know what the message is. And what I did now is I put in a method called area. Not supposed to do anything. This method should not do any, I mean the area method shouldn't do anything. You really have to take these baby steps like this. It's a very important part of the process. So what do you do right here? You change the message or you make it pass. 
So now, whenever we run area, it's always going to return nil because it's a method that doesn't do anything. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the method and I'm going to make it pass. So of course now, I had to write a little bit more code here. And this might not be the best implementation, but it is an implementation because it hasn't been refactored yet. But now, I've made it pass. And now, I'm at great, which is where we want to be. And look how fat. <laughs> you know what? I was being, you know, and Yehuda, you were right. The real answer for this is I should have put 16 right here. But you know what? I'm up here on the stage and I didn't want to have like 15 iterations of this. So what I'm going to say, this is slide 94. Let's say I had like slide 94 sub 26. This is what it would look like. I'm actually caring about your time. <laughs> So now we're back to all our tests pass. So what do we do when all our tests pass? <laughs> we do the cabbage patch. Is that gonna run again? I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, okay, so what do we take from this? Don't be afraid to throw away tests. Um, I, I, I don't be afraid to throw away tests. Actually, Yehuda gave a great test at RubyConf about this, and that was one of the lessons learned I, you, we want, to move, we want to move from less, from more unit tests to less unit tests. We don't really want that unit level. I mean, it helps us get to where we need to be, but when we have these great APIs and we have tests that are API level, who cares what the middle stuff does as long as our API is correct? So don't be afraid to throw tests away. And also, because um, we just need to move on. My daughter knows how to do it, so we, we need to move on too. And I just put this line in here because I just thought it was cool. Once you start, you can't stop. And that's how I feel about the whole testing and getting into throwing things away and making everything right. You can't be scared of just tearing it all out and saying, screw it, let's move on. So now let's talk about a little bit more theory. And this is not the testing part. It's nothing to do with testing. Um, this is the hash rocket break. Pair program if you can. You will write better tests if you have a buddy there with you writing tests with you. I, I pretty much guarantee it. Um, you will write better tests if, um, if you don't cheat. Um, and what I did in my little slide back in slide 96 is I cheated. Don't cheat. Go through all the motions. Don't cheat your code. Um, don't cheat your test. Because all you're doing is cheating. First, you're only cheating yourself whenever you have to look at it next time, or you're cheating the next developer, or you're cheating the company, you're cheating the bottom line, which means you're cheating your paycheck, which means you're just fake. So don't do that. So now we're out of theory. And I put this picture up here, because someone put it on Facebook the other day, and I just thought it was cool. Anybody know where I am in this picture? <laughs> no, actually, I was the funny looking kid in the bottom left. And I think that's the reason I spend so much time home on the computer. And that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so, you know, I just, these things like this keep me grounded. Keep yourself grounded. Um, this is fun. We're here on a weekend talking about Ruby code. Come on. <laughs> so now I want to talk about some more real stuff. Um, a lot of people ask me this. Well, Brian, what does your desktop look like? Uh, I don't subscribe to the HashRocket 30-inch monitor thing. And I don't get the program pair program a lot, unfortunately, because I'm like management, real guy. Management, real guy. Management, real guy. And it usually just ends up over here somewhere. So I actually just use this Mac. I use this Mac for everything. So 1440 by 900 is my resolution. I figured out I use Vim. I have a terminal. And I have auto test. And this is how it looks. I actually almost have, a, I have like an Apple script that actually does all this for me. Um, I think this is very important. And I use black on, I use, I use light text on the black background. I just think it's easier to see. Some people might not agree. But if you notice right here, I actually split. And this is why I don't use TextMate anymore. I want to be able to see my test code while I'm writing the implementation. I, I think that is not too much to ask for. Um, I love TextMate. And I actually did use it for some of these examples because copying as RTF is great for TextMate. But when I'm actually trying to get work done, them or Emacs have been much better to me in the past week. And actually, if you read my blog, I actually did this experiment. And I'm going to finish it up with a post on why I'm sticking with them. So let's look closer at my, my work area here. So I use Nerdtree. Um, Nerdtree is awesome. Nerdtree. 
Vim plugin. And right here you'll see, you'll see my test and you'll see my implementation down here. Ignore this very long method. It actually didn't flog very well. But you know what? We always need something to improve on. So, but it does work because it's tested. So, and then we have my, we have our test window, which you guys have seen. We run all my tests. I don't run my features all the time because, because sometimes you just don't want to run your whole test suite the whole time. So most time I just turn, I just have auto feature equals false, so I don't have to run that. Um, one thing you need to realize is, um, I think one of the, like a pro tip here is that the faster you know that you failed or didn't fail is the faster you'll know your success. So instant feedback is always the key. And so. Now let's get about, let's get into my talk. My talk is like eight slides long. Yeah. <laughs> that before was like the, like the preface. Now let's talk about the talk. So what do we need to do to be better at testing all the F and time? First thing we need to do is we need to write tests first. And you can't get around that. Write your tests first, write your tests first. When DHH yesterday said that, um, he doesn't write tests all the time, he was wrong. Um, because that app that he said he was gonna be using is like their new status app and it needs to be tested. Write your test first. I don't care if you're writing five lines. Um, figure out the appropriate amount of tests. You just, need, just say if you're, writing a, if you're writing a Sinatra application and it has one action, just put a test in there that says that if I pass this in there, it's success. If I don't pass it in there, it's a 404, big deal. Or it's a 500. But you need to have that test. Because you might have been in that right state of mind then, but what, how, do you, how do you judge if features change somewhere else in your app? Or if you add something else on? You might as well just start it at the beginning, write your test first. Um, only write code to make your test pass. If you're putting code in your app and there's no test behind it, or no high level functional or integration level test, why is it in your application? Create a reason for yourself to write code. And the, reason, and the way you do that is by writing a test. Um, submit code to continuous integration. And that's my little continuous integration right here. She's handling my code. Um, it, you're always, what's gonna happen is you're gonna write code and it's gonna be awesome on your desktop and it's gonna be super awesome on your desktop and it's not gonna run in production. If you submit it to a continuous integration on another server, you at least have some guarantee that it ran somewhere else and it, didn't, and it wasn't because of the esoteric settings that you have on your box. Um, number four is write more tests. You're not writing enough tests right now. So think about it, write some more. Um, after you write those tests, write more code. And number six is um, refactor constantly. Um, that's all, our, what we do, and a lot of people won't say this, it's like a, it's a craft. It's not, we don't just go to school for four to eight years and or 12 years or forever like some of us and learn how to become programmers. Um, the people who are here, the people who, who are like leading what we're doing, you know, they treat it like a craft. They don't treat it like it's one plus one equals two. They sit down like an artist, and maybe it isn't art, but they sit down like an artist, and they always try to improve their craft. So what we're gonna do is refactor constantly, like I did in these pictures we did for Christmas. If you notice, we did it until we gave up. <laughs> so what happens if you, do, if you follow my six rules? you'll have profit, at least internal profit. I can't speak for you making money. Um, so, so let's go on to my next part. Um, I talked about gathering metrics, and those methods that I, those methods that I gave you for, um, Rudy, Reek, Arkov, um, and the other one, uh, are easily done for you by MetricFoo. MetricFoo works with, will work with your Ruby project no matter what it is, uh, use this. This is probably one of the most important things I can tell you to put in your app right now. Put that in there. And another important thing I can tell you is read more source code. Um, everybody here should read like a novel. Go find a project. Um, actually, I've learned a lot lately by reading Rake source code, believe it or not. Um, I've read it and I appreciate some things a little bit more. And you know, because I think there's a lot of us to learn, there's a lot that we can learn from just methods. Um, I've learned a lot from Yehuda posting his, his explorations into merging Merv and, and, and what is that? Rails, yeah, Rails. Um, damn, guys. Um, so read source code. I think it's one of the best things we can do for ourselves. And I wanted to set this up for questions, and I know I'm like 40 minutes in. So um, 
My next few slides are bonuses. And if you use OSX, these might be relevant. If not, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, one of my things that I want to tell people is don't use your mouse. And this has nothing to do with testing. I'm done with that talk. Don't use your mouse. Um, get the Google thing, or get Quicksilver, or get LaunchBar. I'm, I'm, actually representing, I'm actually saying LaunchBar is a cost, but LaunchBar 5 is way better than Quicksilver ever was. So try that out. Um, if you're here using Git and you're on a Mac, you should be using Git X. Um, I don't care if you're a Git master. I mean, I can do a lot of the weird things with Git from the command line, but you will not have a better commit or another better view of your project if you're not using Git X on the Mac. And I think this is one of those projects like TextMate that make people who aren't on the Mac think about maybe I would be more, to, more productive on the Mac. Um, I, I, I am all about them today. Because um, I had this, I had this couple month long editor experiment, and I just settled on them. It's funny. Um, back in '94, when I got my first paid Unix job, we used something called VI, and I always spent a whole bunch of time trying to get away from VI. And now look back where I am. Um, so, <laughs> so now, um, and this is something that I don't think people use. Vimperator. If you guys are using Firefox and you like VI or VI or Vim. Um, try this plugin out. It actually allows you to do mouseless things with your editor. Um, just search for it. It's actually pretty awesome, and I don't have anything for it, but it's pretty awesome. So all I want to do is leave you with this. All we can do is make our code work like it should, and what we can should and what it should is, you know, it's up to you really. And the only reason we can, the only way we can do this is by testing on fucking time. So I have a couple things coming up. And the first thing I do is I have um, Taft TV. And I, I've been wanting to do this. I've been wanting to do like a screencast series where I talk about just random things, no cost. Um, I actually do have some episodes planned where I will actually dive into more of the topics that I talked about today and with a little bit more detail. They won't be crazy like the Rails Envy guys. Those guys, I don't have a green screen. So um, can't do all that. But um, I, I promise you they will at least have some content in them. And so March next month, we'll have um, Test All the Fucking Time TV. And um, I want to let you know that my wardrobe and travel were sponsored by my employer, Sourcefire. Um, they allowed me to get here today. And um, I want to say thank you. Um, you guys have been great. So now I know I, I glossed over a lot of things, but I wanted to get a lot of things out there. So I know there's questions. So, and I want to know what happened in IRC while I wasn't on there. So, what's up? You have to tap this dot com doesn't resolve. Have you registered that? No, it doesn't resolve. The MX resolves. Oh. Ah, no websites. All right, let me tell you a story about this. There, there's a story. I'm going to give you a quick story. Last August, I did a talk in D.C. about, I did a talk in D.C. about testing, and some schlub registered TAF.com. And I had to go back and forth them for a little while, and I got the domain back, and I was just so happy I had to set up email, and I didn't put up a website. So that's what happened with that. And that's why there's no website there. It will be, there will be one there. And it probably should forward to something else. Thank you for pointing that out in public. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Aside from uh, mocking and stubbing, uh, how do you keep your tests running as fast as possible? Um, make sure. Well, I'm, this is more of a, OK, let me explain this to you. I'll give you a little. If you have read the pragmatic um, thinking, the refactoring your wetware book, in the beginning of this book, they talk something about the Dreyfus theory or method. And there's like five stages, they, or four stages, that go from like beginner to expert. And what, it, what, what I'm trying to say here is there's the beginner answer, and then there's the expert who knows. And it's more like a sense of, I just know what I should be doing. Um, I can't give you a, de a f definitive answer on that. What I can say is um, stay out the file system, never touch the network, um, respect your object boundaries. So if you're passing, if you're testing object square and, you, and it needs something from object line, um, mock that out. Who cares? You don't care what that is. You just pass that in. So yeah, that, those are the three things I can tell you. Do you directly relate a block store to test feed? No, I don't think it goes down to that level. You can't, no, you can't because Flog only goes through your lines. It doesn't actually, it wouldn't actually not know that. And Flog doesn't look at the times either. But that's interesting though. 
Anybody else? All right. Oh, Mark. Can you compare and contrast Shoulda to our spec and solve this from writing about it all the time? Okay. Yes, I can. I, I can start. I can give you something at a high level. Shoulda is a set of macros on top of test unit. Our spec is its own thing that can actually run text unit. Um, and that's, that's the easy answer. The other answer is shoulda is, um, is macro based and it introduces things like context and little should blocks. Our spec, the big, I guess the big things for that are the syntax of your assertions. I think our spec really, what it really wants to do is get you away from the old X unit style assertions. So instead of saying assert equals foo to thumb, it would actually do foo should equal thumb. So our spec macros, no, reverse that. Should a macros, our spec matchers. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me either. Yeah. <laughs> The, just recently, now all of the should have macros can run in our spec. So I was mainly wondering at a low level what kind of troubles you've had. Oh, okay, I'll tell you my problems with our spec. And this is why last year I decided I would not use our spec pretty much from day to day. If you, have a, if you ever have to R debug in our spec, you'll shoot yourself in the leg because you'll be like, how did it even get there? And where did this add exit hook come from? What am I doing in test unit? I thought I was with R spec. With, with, R, with, with test unit or anything built on top of that, there's a pretty clean path through the code. So you'll know about where you died, why you're there. So if you happen to find a bug inside a test unit, you'll find that bug pretty quickly. And that was my problem with R spec. And also test unit is a little bit faster than R spec. I mean, I know it was a little while ago. I, I don't know how it is now. But on the, like the high level day-to-day -day stuff, they're, they're okay. Either one is fine. Yes? I just want to say about the spiking. I find that sometimes in a longer spike, I'm not talking about like hours, but if you have to go to like half an hour, it's useful at the beginning to write a few high level tests. So I know normally in spikes people don't write tests at all, and it's actually useful to not, but sometimes you're like, okay, I know basically what it has to do. You can write some high level tests and then you can program and make sure you're not breaking stuff <coughs> all the time. Or when you get to like a, okay, it kind of works now, then push it forward, you can write some breakpointing tests, like checkpointing tests? So no, then that's good, because I think you've evolved to the level where you actually can realize what's wrong and versus, versus what's right. And you have a sense of feeling, well, this feels right versus this feels wrong. But a lot of people aren't even to that level yet, where they can't say that they have no feeling, they don't have, their feet aren't even wet for testing. They have no idea where they are. And this is what I'm trying to do, is get people closer to your level where they can actually make that decision. That you know what, I'm gonna write some tests down, then I'm gonna spike. So like that, implement, and then move on. And that's, cause, that's just going to be how I develop. And actually, that's pretty close to how I develop all the time. I always start with, so, you know, I call them my little exploratory test. It's so high that they won't really do anything, and they probably get deleted anyways. But at least they get me started. And the point that I really do use this for, if you're ever developing a command line application, testing a command line application. I should write a blog post on this. It's a hard thing to do, because you're like, oh, that's it. No, it's not. No, no. Um, in the next week or so, I'm going to show you guys how I do that. So, next question. Yes, yeah, Brian, one of, the, uh, one of the things you said about the testing was you test the behavior of the application. Mm -hmm. Showing, like with our spec where it has, you know, given whatever and blah and then blah. And Mark had those exact kind of things um, in his talk yesterday. Right. Talking about the acceptance test. Yes. And, um, you know, knowing how far to go with the testing is always, you know, how much do I actually need to test, right, is always kind of a controversial topic. So past the acceptance criteria, as defined by, say, a customer, thinking if you can get them to get as specific as you have there, where they're testing the behavior, like how far past that would you go with the testing? Since you were saying, like, you don't necessarily need to test conditionals and certain things like that. Um, well, it goes back to that, how comfortable are you? It's at a certain level, at the beginner level, and maybe at the, I don't know if it's the journeyman level, the second, second level, you might have to go a little bit further into your test. Um, being an experienced developer, you might say, well, I already know what's going to happen here, so I'm just going to 
I'm going to test this pack through my code and then maybe test some exceptions and then stop there. Um, but at the beginning, you might have to test the whole, you might have to actually start at the beginning and say, I want to be here. And then ask yourself, well, why am I doing this? And then ask yourself, it's like that five times, ask yourself why, and then write a test for that. And then continue doing that until you have something that actually works. It seems repetitive, but that's how I think I started. And now I, have, I think I have an affinity where I can actually don't have to ask myself why so many times, because I think I started at a lower level, but I could actually just say, oh, I'm just going to write something here, and that should cover me here. And I'm not perfect yet, nowhere close, but I'm a lot closer than I was. So my answer is um, YMMV um, TATFT. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, we're coming up 54 minutes, so. If, 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 if not, I can say um, thanks, you guys, and um, it's been fun. And um, this is the first time I've done this talk, so it, hopefully it didn't suck too bad. And thanks.